Okay, so I'm going to walk you through what it's like to go through the group therapy from the child's perspective. So there's our little book, there's our little acknowledgments and the copyright. This is an interesting program which I just learned about. You can upload a PDF file and have it come back as a PowerPoint. And it mostly works, but you'll see some quirky things in the formatting. The actual workbook looks better than what you're seeing because every now and then little quirky things happen in the translation when my workbook went up into cyberspace and came back to me in a different form. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes you wonder what happens to it when it goes up there, wherever. Okay, um, so we start with just some kind of testimonials. Kids have already been through our group. Here's their words of wisdom. This was always fun to do. At the end of every group that we ran, uh, we would say both some variation of this, both to the parents and the kids. You know, two months ago you came here for the first time, and I remember you look kind of nervous, but now you're a pro. You know everything about this. But in a month, we're going to start another group with another set of kids. And now that you are an expert, what words of wisdom do you have? We were trying not to pull just for tell us everything you loved about group, you know, because we're trying to get some kind of an evaluation or some kind of reflective comment about what the child really could now say as an expert. So what are your words of wisdom for these kids who come in in a month from now who are going to feel just as nervous as you did on that first day? And these are the kind of standard comments that we were getting from kids. They were pretty encouraging. Talk a little bit about confidentiality. You always want to do that when you're doing group therapy. Session one. Every session has the same pattern and rhyme and rhythm to it. There's a lot to be said for kind of that routine with kids and kind of getting them into the pace of the therapy session. Uh, many of our kids have very restricted affect, restricted understanding, restricted language around affect. I'm either happy or mad or nothing. Well, we have lots of emotional states beyond that, and we want kids to gain an increasing awareness of their own affective state so they can modulate it as, as need be. So we, every week we would get them to say kind of, what are you feeling now and why are you feeling that way? And then a standard emotion thermometer, kind of how strongly are you feeling? Are you up in the danger zone? And then the therapist, you know, the lead therapist, the co-therapist always come in with their own examples, kind of help prime the pump a little bit, give examples of what this could be like. You know, I'm kind of anxious, but I'm just kind of like medium anxious because I'm so excited to meet all of you tonight. But a little part of me is anxious because I haven't worked with you before and I don't know how the day to day is going to go. Yeah, whatever. But you just do a little modeling for the kids and they pretty quickly get into this. Um, and it becomes a routine and they start to, again, increase their awareness. Every session does a preview, a review preview. There's no review in session one because they haven't been there before, obviously. But you always want to remind them of what they've learned and tell them what they're going to learn. And then at the end, you review what they've learned for every session. So boom, boom, boom. You're hitting it three times per session. So we're going to start with the fix-it list. We're going to talk about symptoms of mania and depression. We're going to go through the motto. It's not your fault, but it's your challenge. And that, we would have independent evaluators in our trials, um, you know, do the six and 12 and 18 month follow-ups. And a kid would come in saying, well, now that I know it's not my fault, but it's my challenge. And the independent evaluator would say, okay, he's been to group. <laughs> Who else would say that phrase? <laughs> um, mm, tried to keep it masked, but there it went. Um, so those kinds of things always do happen in psychotherapy trials. It's hard to keep it really masked. But when kids really get that message, it's really important. And when parents really get that message, it's important. Kids really need to understand, it's not my fault. Nobody's, nobody in this group is blaming me for the bad stuff I've done. But then the second half is equally important, because otherwise you kind of like, just be in the mind, if you will, of a 10-year-old boy. I love this lady. I've got the best alibi of my life. I don't have to be nice to my sister. I don't have to go to bed when mom says. I don't have to do my homework. I'm bipolar. I don't think so. Oh, that's not how it works, okay? It's not your fault, but it is your challenge. And we give kids a pretty straight up message. This disorder is pretty significant. And if you don't learn how to manage it, it has the potential to really mess up your life. So we don't want that to happen. We're not blaming you at all that you're having these challenges. We understand these are unique challenges for you. And we're here to support you and give you the skills you need to manage it. But you do need to learn how to do this. Okay? So we give a pretty straight up message to kids and they kind of straighten up and take it serious. Okay? So we talk to them of what is depression. Okay? They need to understand the symptoms and they need to understand the symptoms as relates to them in their life. Otherwise, it really doesn't matter. You know, giving them a list that they can take a test is not what this is about. This is about them understanding how it impacts them in their daily life. So we go through with them the symptoms of depression, the symptoms of mania. If, for example, you were running a group and you had almost, all the kids had depression. You were running a mixed group, which is what we always did. And let's say you had no kids with bipolar disorder, all severe depression. You would still want to quickly go through this because you saw that statistic this morning 
a quarter to a half of kids with prepubertal onset will convert. They need to know the warning signs. If you are being treated for depression and suddenly you become manic, suddenly your pharmacologic treatments need to change very abruptly. The psychotherapy, maybe not as much, but the meds, ooh, they need to change fast. So kids and parents need to recognize the warning signs if they are emerging, if they are emerging for the first time into mania. So even if you had a pure depressed group, you would want to quickly cover these points. And we talk about how it can cycle and the various patterns in it can go. And you see we talk about both the kind of elated expansive high, the irritable high, the sad or the angry low. And then we talk about other problems. They need to have some sense of their comorbidities. Uh, and again, I, they don't need to know the DSM-5 code number. I mean, we're not looking for that. But we want them to understand, you know, some of my symptoms. And this is confusing for parents. You know, the ADHD symptoms are very behaviorally responsive. Lots of mood symptoms are not terribly behaviorally responsive. If you are currently grandiose and in an expansive mood, behavioral treatment of that, pure behavioral treatment, isn't really what's going to make it be better. Okay. If suddenly you don't need to sleep, behavioral management of that is not going to fully address that symptom. So what else are you going to do? So kids and parents need to have a broader conceptualization of this. There's the motto. We talk quite a bit about that. And then we get them thinking about the fix-it list. And again, this is standard goal setting. But you know, how do these symptoms of yours, how are they getting in the way at home, school, with friends, other kids? You know, and then what can you realistically do? Let's say you're bombing out of school. We're not going to turn you into a straight-A student in eight weeks. That's not going to happen. But could we build in study habits that aren't so conflictual? If you and mom get into a fight every single day after school about doing homework, and then you slam your book down and you rip up your papers, I bet we could come up with a study plan that works better than that. And that could be a goal. Okay, so you, you, know, you, you get the goals down to a manageable size for eight weeks. We give them very clear instructions. Parents also get this. So, you know, we all, how many of you have had the experience you're in a doctor's office, they tell you what you're supposed to do, it makes perfect sense, you go home and say, what did they say? Okay, huh? Well, what was that? What was that? I should have written that down. Okay, so we write it all down because we know people aren't going to remember, so they've got all the directions there. We give them a sample of every exercise so they can, again, really refresh their memory if they need to. And then we have them start to work on it in group, and then we send them home to do it as a family. So the goal setting, the kids come up with what they want, and we help them turn it into, if one of the goals that they first come up with is, I want my brother to be nicer to me. Say, OK, so you want to have a better relationship with your brother. What are some of the things that you can do to make that happen? So we turn it back into a goal that they are responsible for. You know, like, have my teacher stop being a jerk. Well, OK, so you're having some trouble at school. Let's talk about what are some things that you would like to change at school. We turn it back into you know, where they have the active role. And then the parents will have a list. And then we want to really turn it into more of a family list. So all the attention is really not on the one kid with a diagnosis. Chances are good maybe somebody else has a diagnosis. But chances are good that this child with a diagnosis is not the only bumpy spot in the family. And again, we're not trying to say that there's family systems pathology that's causing the symptoms. That's not where we're going with this. But if kids can be very hypersensitive to yelling, you know, my parent yells at me all the time. Well, probably nobody in the house likes listening to yelling. So how about if a family rule becomes nobody yells? Okay, everybody uses a quiet voice inside. Okay, now it's a family level rule, and it's hopefully positively balanced. Give them a blank to do it. And then we go down and we do wherever we have the, the, we're doing an efficacy to effectiveness trial right now, so we don't have a gym in those community-based settings, but they have kind of a large room. They get up, they have some large motor movement. When they're done with that, now you've got kids who have been all activated. How are you going to calm them back down a little bit? Breathing, deep breathing. It's used in so many interventions, and we really want kids to have a strategy. When we get to the toolkit, you'll see breathing shows up on all of their lists because you always have your breath with you. Okay, very DBT kind of concept, but our breath is always with us. Wherever we are, we can breathe. In fact, wherever we are, we should be breathing. Okay, um, but if we breathe really fast and hyperventilate, that's not good. So we really teach them diaphragmatic breath. And so we're down on the floor. One therapist is down on the floor, showing their belly going up and down, not their chest, but their belly. You know, so all the good diaphragmatic stuff. The other therapist is going around monitoring, making sure they're really getting it. And then we have them record over the course of the week, not only the child but the parent also. Parents need every tool they can get to manage their own emotions because it's really stressful living with a child with bipolar disorder. And then when parents can learn to kind of do that chill out, take a big deep breath, um, it is very helpful for them also. That's session one. Session two, they come back. We do the news of the week. We check in on feelings, check in on strength of feelings. 
kind of have to go over the rules for the first couple of times pretty soon, but usually by session three, this is so automatic. They are just in the groove. And now we do the review preview. Now we have a review. So we go back, we touch up, you know, quickly on the fix-it list. We go over the projects that they've, you know, they bring back their project, their fix-it list. And if it's a family project, we talk about it when the parents and kids are all still together. When we go to the kid room only, if there are kind of extra issues to talk about, bumpy stuff that you kind of noticed in the big discussion, you kind of keep ironing that out till you feel like you kind of have a lid on that. Um, quickly review what you talked about in terms of symptoms, the motto, and then you go into the preview, naming the enemy and how we get help. So this is my, ooh, where did I have this? This is one of our favorite exercises. So naming the enemy, we do this as a group, and then the kids go home and do it with their family. And in this exercise, I always feel kind of hokey when I describe this, but it's like actually really powerful. Language is powerful in a family. So we have the kids come up with attributes about themselves. Kind of the core of who they, what we want is what Michael White talks about externalizing the symptom. You are not your disorder. We really want kids to truly in their bones get that concept. You are not your disorder. Your disorder is a feature of who you are. Um, you're, you know, you have dark hair. Um, you tell funny jokes. Uh, you really love dogs. Those are all features of who you are, okay? But the disorder is only part of what you are. So list your attributes over here. List the symptoms that you personally are experiencing from the mood disorder and then any comorbid conditions. And then what we tell the kids, this is the part where I feel corny as I explain it, but it really works in families. The problem is your symptoms are literally covering up who you, who you are. So through the course of this group, what we're going to do is give you strategies that you can go home and work on to literally put the symptoms behind you so that the real you shows again. Okay? So it sounds a little corny. Kids love it. They go home. They do this with their families. Once you've done that, now the family has a new language. It's not my crabby, rotten kid. It's my child who gets really irritable at times. And when he doesn't sleep enough, it's really miserable for everybody. So what are we going to do about the sleep you know, or whatever? But it changes it from it being the person to it being symptoms that we together have to solve. And then we talk about the different places that kids can get assistance. There are things that happen at school that can be beneficial, therapy. Uh, for many of our kids, they're on medicine. We want them to start thinking about how do you know if the intervention you're getting is helping? You know, we really want kids to realize that they have a voice and to some degree a choice in their treatment. They need to be active participants and we need to respect that and we need to coach them to be very effective active participants in their own treatment. How do you know if it's not working? If a medicine is giving you a lot of side effects and you're really not seeing the benefit, you probably shouldn't keep taking it. It might be that other people in your life are seeing the benefits and you aren't, and then we need to get a dialogue going about that. And then how can you be a team player to fight the enemy and reveal more of yourself? Then we give them some examples of how you can gather those clues. Then we have them think about, and most kids do not come in, if they even know the name of their medicine, that's kind of remarkable. Almost no kid knows the dose. I mean, that's kind of more than we'd expect. Uh, we would like them to know, do I take like one blue pill in the morning and then two pink ones at night? Or, you know, whatever they can tell us, we want them to be able to record. But we want them to know why they're taking it. I would not swallow pills every day if I didn't know why I was doing it. So why would I expect a child that I'm treating to swallow a pill every day if he or she doesn't know the benefit or the potential benefit? They shouldn't. Okay, so we really need to educate them to make sure they understand that. So we do a little bit of a review, and again, this is, you're going to really, every group will look different because it depends upon the composition in the group, where their intellectual capacity is, how much in depth you're going to go into, but you're going to follow the lead of kind of where they're at and give them the information at a level and to a degree that's beneficial to them. But we want them to have some understanding of their classes of medicines, target symptoms for which those medicines are used, and then you monitor to see if they're working or if they're just causing a bunch of bother. If they're just causing a bunch of bother, you probably should change it. Side effects, what to do about it. We give them kind of just the nuts and bolts about all of that stuff. We talk about that cost-benefit analysis of how do you figure out, is it helping you? There might be some nuisance effects, and let's talk about how you can solve that problem. I gave you the example this morning of the boy who wanted the, needed the water bottle and then the bathroom passes. That's an easy fix. Um, so you kind of work those things out. Weight gain is huge. Um, literally and figuratively. It's a huge problem for many kids, and so we really need to tackle that. 
We know that aerobic exercise is a good antidepressant, so that's one of the things that we're going to want to weave in. If you're gaining some weight, the medicine might be beautiful at stabilizing your mood, but if you're gaining a pound every, like almost two pounds a week, which is not uncommon, we've got to get right on that. We've got to really look at your eating habits. You know, you've got to, got to work very carefully at that. Then we go through how to do the naming the enemy exercise at home. There's an example. There's a blank. Yeah. So Jenny is caring, a good helper, a good swimmer, very loving, a good student. She likes computers. She's good at basketball. She's smart. She shares well with her siblings and her friends. But she's got low energy. She's, while she's depressed, she's irritable and disrespectful. She's crying. She hates herself. When she's manic, she talks too fast. She doesn't sleep very much. She's aggressive. She acts really wild and silly and inappropriately. And as a general rule, she's kind of unorganized and has homework struggles and doesn't concentrate well. And when she's been really impaired, she's been hearing voices. So this is kind of a conglomerate of various kids that we've seen. Yeah. Then we do bubble breathing. So we do belly, bubble, balloon breathing. And again, with this younger group, it's really fun to do the imagery along with it. So whenever I'm doing the bubbles, I, I kind of tell this big story, you know, shut your eyes and imagine that you're you know, blowing bubbles and we'll bring bubbles into the session, you know, the little wands. And I like to tell a big story, but, you know, the shimmery colors of the bubbles and kind of the purpley translucent on the outside and then you watch the bubbles going up into the sky and then poof, there they pop. And, you know, you can really make a nice imagery out of it all and you want to think about how many senses can you bring into it all. So as the kids are doing the breathing, they've got this sort of happy place that they can go to in their head as they're doing the bubble breathing. That's session two. Session three, where have you seen this before, right? Okay, so again, you get that repetitive, starting with that, the review preview. And now we're gonna work on the toolkit. And this is, again, it's a nice and powerful exercise, nothing new about it. We use the acronym CARS because CARS take you places you wanna go. So it's creative, active, rest and relaxation, and social. We want kids to think about what are things you can do and really they may have one strategy that they use, but they need more than one strategy. You need things you can do in the middle of math class. You need things you can do at 11 o'clock at night when everybody's supposed to be in bed and quiet. You need things you can do after school. You need things that you can do in all different settings. So we want them to think about you know, what they can do to build their toolkit. We'll talk, um, so we do the, the, the preview, and then we start talking about triggers. What are the triggers that get you to, and we use rhyming, mad, bad, sad, because it's so easy to remember. What are the triggers that just like this can put you in a place that you don't like being emotionally? And by now they're getting a little bit more connected to emotional states and have a little better awareness typically. Um, so what are those triggers? Just like a light switch goes on. And then we have them think physiologically, where are they getting those sensations on their body? which kids don't always have an immediate sense of. And this is where having the group is really nice because as kids start throwing out ideas, it's like, oh yeah, that happens to me too. My face gets really hot. Um, I feel my stomach just going into butterflies. Um, I feel my hands clenching up, my shoulders get tense. You know, as one kid starts to endorse the other one, say, oh yeah, yeah, that's me too. Or they come up with other examples. Okay. So we have them circle on, their bo on the body. We do a big group exercise and then they're gonna work on this for themselves. Then we have them think about, well, what do you do when you're feeling, when the trigger happens, you get the sensation in your body. And a lot of kids will say, well, I, you know, I just, I just get mad. And they, they, they don't see that progression. So the more we can get that bodily awareness, the more chance it gives us to get in there and intervene and, you know, help them find a place where they can get in and do something different. So we want them to think about what do they do when they're having those mad, sad, bad feelings, what's the negative action they tend to take? So it's, you know, kick the dog, hit my brother, rip up my homework, something along that line. Okay. Build the toolkit. So here are some examples under creative, draw, play music, build Legos, write stories or a journal. Active, take a walk, ride a bike, play outside, jump on the trampoline, dance. R&R, &R, take a bath, read a book, get a drink or snack, listen to music, take a nap, do 15 bubble breaths. Um, social, talk to parent, talk to friends, talk to pets, play with a friend, anything. Or the opposite, like when I'm feeling really bad, I need to withdraw for a little while, and maybe that's what's going to calm me down. So then sometimes 
you know, withdrawing from people is the best strategy that somebody might have, as long as it's not, you know, for days on end. But if somebody needs like 20 minutes alone in their room to cool down when they're really feeling kind of agitated, that would go under the social. So then we work through an example. So we have them fill out their toolkit. We think of a trigger. We have them mark on their body where it feels. And then what we want them to do over the course of the week is, and they need to negotiate with this with their parents, how are they going to remember to use their toolkit? How could their parents, in maybe kind of a humor-filled way, remind them to use the toolkit in a way that won't feel like nagging? And that's a really important piece. Um, humor is really useful, because if you are laughing about it, you aren't crying about it. <laughs> Um, that's a better choice. Um, do, they, do the parents remind them or do they remind themselves? And then what tool did they use and what was the outcome? So then we want them to monitor this over the week. So we had one family where this boy would get you know, really pretty angry pretty quickly. Family had taken a lovely trip, vacation to Maine, summer vacation. And so the mom would say the key word, and this kid, when he got angry, he was one of those kids where the whole face turns beet red. Okay. So as he was starting to get angry, mom would just say, lobster, really softly, lobster, um, which was kind of funny. And for him, it brought back this whole memory of this wonderful family trip to Maine and the really great meals that they had and the food. And it like helped him just quickly get to another place. And she could say it in front of other kids. And probably nobody even else attended her. If they did, it was like, why did your mom randomly say lobster? You know? But for this kid, it was the very private cue I need to go calm down now. Okay, so it's that it's a little funny. Um, give give some privacy. Uh, kids will make these signs and put them up in their bedroom. We've had kids plaster this on their refrigerator. Kids go around and oh, we had one kid make like 20 photocopies and plastered it all over his house so he would remember. Um, so go for it, whatever kind of works. Give them a blank to do it. We have them record at least three times over the course of the week, and then we do balloon breathing. So here, again, you can have the imagery either of blowing up the balloon or letting the air come out of a balloon, kind of however you want to do that story. Make a nice image all the way around it. Give them lots to kind of be thinking about. Um, and that's a lovely, another way of doing the deep breath. And again, you keep monitoring. So as they're practicing, one therapist goes around the room and makes sure that they haven't slipped back to that upper chest breathing, which is not going to give you the physiologic response that you need. You need that deep belly breathing. That's session three. Then session four. Again, standard. Again, each time they do the news of the week along with the feelings. And then the new uh, topic for this week is are the fundamentals of cognitive behavioral therapy. So now what's the connection between thinking, feeling, and doing? And you'll see also that as we do this review preview, every concept is really stacking on top of the one from before. And so you see, even though it's a lot of material to cover in eight weeks, we do the you know, repetitive work every time, and every concept is building on the one from before. So they're used to the trigger. They're used to the feeling. And if, if I got a bad grade on my project, and I'm feeling sad and angry, how do I want to feel? Well, I would like to feel happy or relaxed. A lot of kids don't even try to get to happy. They just want to get to calm. For a lot of our kids, that's really their goal. I just want to feel calm. Um, so how do I do it? We get them to think about and make these connections. We want them to understand the point of these arrows. So if you're feeling sad and angry, what do you tend to do? Does it affect what you do? And we start throwing out examples. And pretty soon, they're all agreeing, yeah, what I feel and what I do, pretty connected. So in this case, yell at my parents, kick the dog, throw things, stay by myself. Is what you do connected to what you think? And we start throwing out some examples. And pretty soon, they get, oh, sure enough, um, I tend to think really negative thoughts. Uh, and we use the language helpful and hurtful here because that's the functional result. So I hate my life. Uh, this isn't fair. Nothing ever goes the way I want. I'm a loser. No one cares. So lots of negative cognitions that tend to come pouring out of the kids. Uh, so if you want to feel happy, you can't just you know, flip a switch and change how you feel. But you've just told me that what you do and what you think is connected to how you feel. So maybe we can start to change. You've got some, you've got some choices here about what you choose to do and what you choose to think. So we're, again, we're inserting that there is a place that you can do something. Because when kids come in, they'll tell us, there's nothing I can do. It just happens. And then I'm kicking somebody, and then I'm in trouble, and then I'm grounded. Or I'm in the principal's office, and there's nothing I can do. Well, you start pulling this back and dissecting, and you start to give kids the room to do something. So what are some helpful things you could do instead of these hurtful things? Talk to some. And this is where they're starting to pull out of their toolkit. 
um, talk to somebody about how I'm feeling, ride my bike, listen to music, take deep breaths. What are some of the helpful thoughts you could have so you're starting to counter those negative cognitions? Even when I have a hard day, things always get better. Sometimes things do go my way. I know my parents love me. Whatever the positive kinds of more helpful thoughts, as we would call them. Um, and then if you're starting to think those thoughts, so if you're thinking, well, everybody's got a bad day, um, but things always end up getting better, and I'm going to go ride my bike around the block, how are you going to feel after you do that for about a half an hour? Well, I'll feel better. Okay. So, see, you did have some control over, you know, the feeling was just there, but you did have some things you could do to change it. So we get the kids to kind of see where their ability to make change occurs. Give them the directions on it. Give them another example. And we work through, if they can't come up with an example, we'll work through the example in the book, but it's always best, and it usually happens in a group format, when you can get kids to start coming up with their own ideas. And they'll help each other. So one kid's trigger, the other kids in the group will end up coming up with actions and thoughts that they could use to replace. We give them a blank. We go back to belly breathing. So we do each of the breathing twice, and then by week seven and eight, we let them choose whichever one they want to practice for the week. And that is session four. Then we move on to session five. Same old, same old. Same old, same old. And now we move to problem solving. So again, you get the trigger. You pull something out of your toolkit to stop. None of us can act clearly when we're very emotion ridden. So if you're familiar with DBT, there's kind of that wise mind that brings the, you know, you're thinking and you're feeling, but you don't just act on emotional mind. You know, we don't want people to be acting purely from their guts. We want them to calm down enough that they can think straight. Okay? So you pull something out of your toolkit and then think, what is the problem and what are some of the brainstorming solutions I could do about it? Plan, which one am I going to do? Do it and then check. When we first started this, we called it stop, think, plan, check. And one kid finally said in group, but when do you do it? So now it's stop, think, plan, do, check. You have to do the thing. So we have them come up with give them the directions. So here's an example. I got angry because I don't understand my homework. I took some deep breaths. What's the real problem? Um, it's not just that homework is hard, but I'm tired after school and math is hard, so I get frustrated. That's the more precise problem that now you've really defined it carefully. And you'll spend probably most of the time in the problem solving exercise helping kids really define what the problem actually is. Once you've done that, it's easier to start doing something with it. So don't worry if you're spending most of your time there. I would expect you would. Whoop, then you do the brainstorming. So I could copy my friend's homework. I could ask my mom for help. I could ask the teacher for help. I could do math in the morning when I'm not tired. This child tried number three, asking the teacher. They did it. Did it work? Yes. Next time, I'll ask the teacher for help. Okay. Go back to bubble breathing. And that's session five. Session six, so again, feelings, strength of feelings, news of the week, review, preview, and now we move into communication skills. Talk, have kind of a general conversation about what is communication, um, why is it important, what's verbal and nonverbal communication. We get them to start thinking about the components of nonverbal communication. Very nice research done at NIMH shows that kids with bipolar disorder really have trouble reading facial features, particularly of children. So if I think that all four of you are really angry with me, I might, after lunch, kick over your lunch box, and I might purposely kind of shoulder into you, and I might say something really rude to you, and then you're trying to play a game with me, and I just walk away and ignore you. Well, now all four of you really are upset with me, and I've created a very negative environment for myself that didn't used to exist, but now I have made it happen. So it's a pretty common experience that kids will say, well, he was picking on me. He started it. And the playground monitor, the teacher will say, I didn't see anything. I only saw you hitting that other child. And the child's perspective really was the other person started it. They truly perceived their world that way, except it didn't happen that way by any other objective standard. Okay. But we really have to work, I think, specifically on nonverbals with our kids because they do not read it correctly. So we talk some about the communication cycle. Where does it go right? Where does it go wrong? Where can it break down? So somebody's sending a message. Somebody else is receiving the message. You send a message back. The person receives the message. Okay, so all the places that it can go right or wrong. 
and then we break down what are those components. And then we do some kind of fun exercises during the group where you do these very exaggerated examples using each of these, um, where it kind of really illustrates the components of nonverbal communication. We give them their directions. We play charades then in the group, and this is probably the most popular game that we do with the kids. Uh, they love it. So they, one kid gets a card. You have the pre-made cards that are in the, in the workbook. And the, you know, one child will go up in front of the group. All the rest of the group is trying to you know, guess what their emotional state is. And then so after they've played this game and they get a lot of feedback, um, you can also take, um, with a digital camera, you can take pictures and show them their face. They can do this at home also so they can see the facial expression that they're trying to make to convey how they feel. Because we also have kids who have a real poor ability to show on their face how they are feeling. Like, I'm really happy now. Now I'm really angry. Now I'm sad. Okay. And they're really trying to show you, but it, like, there's not much on the face that's given any clues. Um, so we send the kids home to practice nonverbals. Uh, with their parent where the child has to guess what the parent and, and kids so often will also then misinterpret their parents facial expression um, So we have them guess that and then we have the parents guess the child's facial expression And if you've got a kid who really doesn't show much variance on their face use a digital camera take pictures and then kind of talk through with them you know, What what could you do to your face to make it look different or stand in front of a mirror and do this kind of help kids get some immediate feedback about Well, how would I know that this is true? I had a child who was, must have been dysthymic in utero. Um, I, I, out of desperation, I really went into a mirror with him and said, can you show me a smile? I mean, I, I want to see if your face can produce a smile. Um, later on in treatment, he saw me. He was having a med appointment one day. And he said, Dr. Freistad, Dr. Freistad, I have to show you something. And I came over and he said, look. And then he gave me this huge grin. I was <laughs> like, thank you. You just made my week. Okay. Um, but some kids really do struggle with that. We have them go home and practice that, and they go back to balloon breathing, and that is session six. Session seven, again, feeling, strength of feelings, news of the week, review, preview, and now we're going to move into verbal communication. So we do a quick little review again of that communication cycle, and then we have them think about the language that they use, um, and what are the phrases that really don't get across what they really need. So this is the kind of assertive communication using I statements. Uh, when you do this, I feel this. I would like you to do you know, X, Y, Z. Um, that kind of, I feel X when you do Y. Could you please do Z? Um, so you're stupid. I hate you. I'm not doing it. You can't make me shut up. Um, and shut up is interesting because that just gets used kind of as a you know, different kind of exclamation now. Um, we're talking about the shut up, angry kind. Um, the I don't care. Uh, I'm stupid. I'm a loser. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to beat you up. Um, so how do you change that language? So, um, and also the things that are very inflammatory for parents, the I'm going to kill myself, which is really just in every day if you just go out and listen to kids talking, they will say that in a way that they totally don't mean it. But we want our kids to really think about it. So in my household where we have unusual conversations, my son was about eight and we're sitting around the dinner table and he said something to the effect of, oh, I could just kill myself, at which point his psychologist mother kind of went, you know, bonkers on him. And I slammed my hand down on the table. And he was like, oh, there goes mom. Whew. You know, whew. We're going to have one of those events now. And I said, do you mean that? And he's like, mean what? I said, you just said you wanted to kill yourself. Is that what you mean? He was like, oh, she's really going nuts so on me. I said, I work with kids who really do want to kill themselves. And if you do feel that way, we need to get you immediate help urgently. We might need to bring you to the hospital. But if that's not what you meant by your words, then you need to choose words that really get at what you mean. Now this was kind of dramatic. It was one trial learning for my son. He never said it in my earshot ever again. <laughs> he didn't want to put up with that from his mother. Um, but kids will use language. And in an everyday context, I actually knew perfectly well he did not mean that when he said it. But I also wanted him to think about what he says. So when a typically developing kid says something like, I want to kill myself, Probably shouldn't let them get away with that either. But when a child who has been suicidal says that in that same kind of vernacular, that can absolutely scare the living daylights out of the parent. Because what if they meant it this time? You know, and how do you know? So you really want kids to think about the meaning of their words and use them appropriately. Okay. And my poor child has somehow managed to have his mother a psychologist all these years. Okay. 
Um, so then we send them home with a, what can oftentimes be a very powerful family exercise. This is, I, I, I love really almost all of the exercise, all of the exercises we do. But we'll have the family really think about, and by now they've, you know, we're getting kind of close to the end of our group. And we want them to really to think about the parent-child communication. So we have kids say, what could their parents do to improve communication between parent and child? And then the parents go back and fill in the, we could communicate better if the kids did this. And we've had some very aha moments when families come back because neither side has realized where the other has had issues. Um, and they can st this can be one of those just magical exercises where you get families to really start talking with each other more and, and being respectful and, and caring of the other's perspective. Um, so it can be very much an eye-opening kind of an experience. And using a calm, soft voice happens in almost every child's list. And parents get a little chagrined. Um, parents oftentimes get kind of called out <laughs> in group because their parent kids will say what the parent did that they did not appreciate. Um, almost always involves yelling. Let me talk to, use kind words, okay? And in this case, what the parent came back with was look at the adult when he or she is talking, wait until the other person is finished, and use a calm and inside voice, okay? So very reasonable requests, okay? But this kind of gets the family talking about that, and that's where you see the kind of change in the, within the family dynamic that can occur. There's their blank, there's, now they get to choose their breathing exercise, but everybody, parent and child, everybody gets to do it and then session eight. So here's just a big review session. What's very fun in session eight, after we go through all of this, we kind of have a little summary slide, then we play a Jeopardy kind of game. And it happens with every group. There's some kid in the group that you think, I really hope his parents learned something. Don't know that he got anything out of being in group, but you know, it's over now. And then you play Jeopardy, and that kid knows all the answers. It's like, how did you do that? You look like you were tuned out while we were talking about that. And they end up actually knowing it. Um, so that's pretty fun. And the kids have a great time. And they always surprise us with how much they actually did learn from group. We give them one last breathing exercise. We give them a certificate. And we have a nice little graduation ceremony. So the therapists have this prepared ahead of time. You have a little speech ready to say about what very specific behavioral feedback on what that child contributed to the group and how you see them having benefited from group. And it's just a beautiful, solidifying kind of experience at the end where the, parent, the families come together and you do this. Um, and it's very fun. That is the kid. And then we have extra handouts at the end. So I'm going to go through that. Any questions that you have about the kids part of the group? before we move on to the parents. Um, I would love to have them done in other places. We are doing an efficacy to an effectiveness trial right now in Columbus. Um, but everything that you really would kind of need to get started on this would be available now. So I would encourage people to do this. For those who were at the keynote yesterday, uh, the rainbow program being done out of the University of Illinois Chicago is you, we can hair split over what the differences are between our treatment but they're remarkably similar they really are uh, so I, in Chicago they're doing groups I don't know how well uh, other people are kind of picking up on the idea I would love to know that people are doing this and I would love to hear back some feedback on how it's going okay um, so I think we will go through the parent workbook and then we'll take a little bit of a break so what did the parents do? Here's all those early pages. Give them a little summary of what all the projects will be. Contact information for therapists. Their words of wisdom from previous parents. We give them those goals. So you saw the slide of this earlier. We go over precisely that content with parents. We want them to really get the point of this intervention. With the parents, we'll do a little bit of kind of a housekeeping at the beginning. Um, guidelines for sessions. You've got to have somebody show up. Um, the parent who's coming to group, oftentimes one parent will come to group, the other one will stay home with the other kids, assuming there's siblings in the home. But we really convey that we really want the other parent to be a part of it. Um, so that, you know, go home and share the workbook, you know, go over the content, talk about this at home. And we talk a lot about, you know, therapy's only going to work if you do. Um, you only have eight weeks. You have a lifetime with your child. It's going to take time. It's a week and a half of being here in group. You've got your transportation time, and then we're going to really expect you to do projects when you go home. But it's eight weeks. It's two months of your life. Put the time in now. You'll regain the benefits later. Okay. So we do a big, 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 big push on attendance and participation and, and doing the projects. No one should be punished for their comments. That's kind of standard in group, maintaining confidentiality. 
that whole cell phone thing. Uh, we remind the parents not to let their kids bring in backpacks, electronic toys, headphones, games, food, that kind of stuff to group. A lot of times by the last week, families will ask, can they bring in cupcakes or something to have it be a real party? And, that's, and as long as nobody's got a food allergy around that, that's great. Um, some common difficulties, we kind of predict problems ahead of time and try to troubleshoot them. It's going to take time. You bet it will take time. Um, and we believe that the time you invest now, you'll get the payback in the future. Um, it's hard to remember to do these projects. It is. So make your plan on your drive home or your transportation home, whatever that might be. Make your plan about when you're going to do your projects. Um, it doesn't seem useful. Some of these ideas, like, you don't quite know, why, are you why am I playing charades with my child? You know, what is the point of that? Uh, believe us that these are all there for a good reason, and you might not see the effect right away, but these projects are going to build on each other and will really pay off at the end. Uh, we didn't understand it. Um, we have directions everywhere, and you can always call the therapist in between sessions if you need to. So one of our kids said, if you do it, it works. So we like that motto. Um, do projects early and often, just like voting in Chicago. Uh, use them every day. Practice makes perfect. Bring your questions in and keep practicing. You know, these are only eight sessions, but you're going to keep using. These are really the fundamentals of good therapy, so keep using these skills after you've learned them. We go over mood myths uh, with parents, uh, some of the facts about depression and bipolar disorder. Um, and we talk about kind of cause versus course. Much of what we were talking about this morning are the very kinds of slides and content that we go over with the parents. So we want them uh, myths. It'll go away on its own. You know, you do that ostrich thing. You stick your head in the sand. It'll all go away. No, yeah, no, it doesn't. Not if you really have a bona fide mood disorder. Everybody gets this way. Everybody has ups and downs. But most people don't have clinical ups and downs. You ought to just snap out of it like it's some moral imperative. And we have a lot of in-law, outlaw, ex-law stories. Um, so you know, my mother-in-law just doesn't believe the trouble we're having with Brandon. And she says when she raised my husband, she didn't have to have these kind of struggles. Okay, So we get that a lot. I say, great. What are you doing over spring break? What's Brandon doing over spring break? Send him to grandma. Okay. So you send Brandon to grandma. Three days into spring break, what do you think happens? Phone rings. Grandma says, I see what you mean. Okay. Now you've gone from somebody who's been sabotaging you in the extended family and kind of almost trying to get a little marital rift going to now you have support. Because now your mother-in-law sees where the struggles are. And it's not just your bad parenting that caused this behavior. Because it really isn't about your bad parenting. Okay. So there are ways that you can kind of try to enlist some support. And if you can't enlist support, you just start to ignore. So we really work with families on how do you kind of get that support from extended family. Okay. Um, getting treatment is a sign of weakness. No, it's a sign of good judgment. People who talk about suicide are just trying to get attention. I hope they get ours, and I hope we do something useful for them. Mood impaired kids are just bad or lazy. If you are 15 and you're irritable and you're hypersomnolent and you are anhedonic and you just don't have energy for anything, you are not the reason your parents had children. Okay. Um, you are not very appealing at that point in time. Um, but for the parent to stand outside the door on Saturday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon when the teenager is still sleeping and think, you good for nothing, rotten, lazy, no good kid, is not a particularly helpful concept. Doesn't help keep the parent's expressed emotion down. Doesn't do anything useful for the parent-teen dyad. Um, and doesn't help the kid in any meaningful way. So if you can see, wow, you're really struggling with symptoms of depression. Your irritability has really gotten back in full force. Your sleep cycle is all out of whack. And you've lost all your energy and interest and motivation to do anything. What are we going to do about the depression? Now, which kid would you rather be, the kid with parent A or the kid with parent B? Okay. Um, so we really want parents to be able to see, again, it's that externalizing the symptoms, the Michael White concept that we do in that symptom self exercise. We want parents to see these as symptoms that need to be managed not a dirty, rotten, no good kid. Okay. Teenagers are just moody. Um, they mostly are, but they mostly snap out of it, and it's not long lived. If you've got a long standing pattern of moodiness, now you're in that mood disorder category. We go over depression facts and bipolar facts, all that kind of stuff. We talk about why people don't get help. And this is some of the what they're going to be hearing out there and where in that larger world in which they function, where they're going to get kind of blowback for being in treatment, potentially. And it really hurts when it comes from your siblings, your in-laws, 
um, the neighbors down the street, et cetera, and you've got to have really kind of a centered notion of why it is you're doing what you're doing for your child. Okay. We talked some about those genetics. So some of those same slides that we were looking at in terms of genetics, we go over that information with the parents. And when we do that, again, if you've got a couple in the room and you see the elbow go, you, number one, you know you've hit a chord. <laughs> you've really kind of gotten to them therapeutically. But it'll be like, see, that's your crazy Uncle George. And it may be crazy, Uncle George, but what are you going to do about it? You know, life's a crapshoot. We get the genes we get. We pass on the genes we pass on. We don't have control over that. It is as it is. So if you got crazy Uncle George's genes, what are you going to do about it? You know, let's just move on and, and, and be positive and forward thinking. Okay. We do a little summary sheet. And again, depending upon the nature and the composition of the group, you're going to go in more depth or less depth. But we give them some of the, what we understand about neural circuitry. We give a little bit of what goes wrong in the brain that really causes these problems. Your child is not actively choosing to be manic. Your child is not actively choosing to be depressed. Her brain works differently. And here's what we know today about the science of your child's brain. So, have, you know, and once you have that real awareness of my child's brain really is working on a structural and functional way differently than that kid's brain, it's a little easier to be patient, okay? So you can understand the symptoms. It doesn't excuse behavior. It doesn't condone violent outrages, you know, rages. It doesn't condone dangerous behavior, but it helps parents be much more, I think, empathic. Okay, then we talk some about depression. So we cover both mania and depression and what we know about that in the field. And again, you're gonna go into more or less depth depending upon who you've got in your group. We go over that motto with the parents. We talk about what makes diagnosing mood disorders tricky, just like we were doing earlier today. And we talk about how do you, how do you understand what a mood disorder is? What is it that the clinician is doing? So we want parents to get this. You know, how are we tracking symptoms over time so the parent knows how to track it over time? We go over all the symptoms and criteria for them. Same kind of content that we went over this morning. Again, not to have them become mental health experts and take exams and become you know, licensed clinicians, um, but we want them to learn how to more effectively uh, help their child and be a good spokesperson for their child when they come into clinical appointments. So we talk about suicidal concerns, co-occurring conditions, psychotic symptoms, all the stuff that we covered this morning. We give them a quick fact sheet on depression and one on mania so they can take these single sheets that you can photocopy and take to the school. Uh, can be very helpful. And then we talk with them about the fix-it list. And for each of the projects, we give coaches tips. We want parents to think about how they really can function as the coach for their child. You know, we're with them an hour and a half a week. But the parent is with them those remaining hours, or many of those remaining hours. And what can the parent do on site that we really can't do in the, you know, confines of our therapy offices? So um, give coaches tip on the fix-it list. And then we kind of remind them, be ready to share this next week. <laughs> you might get called out if you don't actually do it. So um, you, know, you want to make sure you've got that ready so you can share next week. We give them an example, talk about, and, and then we talk about how they're going to do it. When the kids come back um, to, and join up with the parents, so let's say you've got the parents in one room and the kids go out and they come back, we always have three spokespersons uh, from the kids group, one who goes over what the lesson of the day was, one who describes the project, and one who goes over the demonstrates the breathing exercises. And that does a couple of things. One is you might think that the kids really got it, but if they have to explain it to the parents, if they didn't quite get it right, it's your chance to kind of quietly get in there and be that bug in the ear to kind of help make sure that they really do know what the exercise is. Um, and then it also gives a chance for the parents to kind of hear it. Now, the therapist will already have gone over uh, with the parents what the kids are supposed to be doing, but then the kids come in and do it again and you have a chance to talk all together. And then we have the parents start to do some mood log recording so that they start also to attend to the symptoms that are present and their severity so they can start to see the patterns over time. It might be that as they start to really track this, they'll start to see what the patterns are. Or there are certain triggers. It's like starting to do a functional behavioral analysis, which you can't do until you start, until, until you start tracking symptoms. So you have to start keeping a mood log to get a sense of that. So monitoring mood symptoms can help uncover patterns. And then we also kind of want to remind them that not every up and down they experience is part of the mood disorder. I mean, all kids have ups and downs. All kids have good days, bad days. Bad things can happen, and you're going to expect that, and you can have a down day that has nothing to do with depression. 
So we want them to be aware of that. There's an example of a mood disorder that's hard to see on the screen. We give them a blank. We give them an easy mood chart with an example. Give them a blank. And then we go over breathing also with them. And then the kids come in and demonstrate it. So that is session one for the parents. In session two, we talk about medication. Um, and with them, we go over again, kind of that cost-benefit analysis. We really talk very specifically about how they can do their part in terms of treatment, um, how to keep a medication log, how to report side effects, treatment response, any questions they have, reminding them that your memory is really good at the time. But if you come in for a med appointment two weeks later, it's hard to really remember that. So we have a clinician in the community who used to never refer to me for anything, um, certainly none of my studies, none of the work that I did. And then one day she saw me in the public library and said, wow, when are you running your next group? I was kind of surprised she asked. And I told her, and she said, I love it when my patients come to your group because then they come back for their appointments and they come in with a notebook and they have questions written down and they have observations about how the child's done on medicine and it really helps me prescribe in a more thoughtful manner. But wow, that's exactly why we do this. That's what we wanted to have happen. So we really want parents to come in being much better record keepers because how can somebody do a good job of prescribing when they get sort of, I don't know, I think maybe he's doing better or maybe not. What a, what's a prescriber supposed to do with that information? You know, how do you know how, where to go? So we want people to become better um, at recording that information. We go over some of the same kinds of medication issues that we were talking about this morning to make them good informed caregivers. We go over the categories of medicine, the side effect management, and we talk some about CAM, the complementary and alternative medicines. We go over the classes of medicines. And then we talk about how to do naming the enemy. We give them the example, some of the coach's tips. We'll um, help the child increase awareness of his or her own moods and feelings kind of during the, during the course of the week. You know, how are you feeling right now? How strong is that feeling? Getting kids just without doing it like every day, five times a day, which could get a little irritating for the child, but just kind of having some conversation and awareness. And then for the parent to model, you know, you're driving along the road and somebody cuts right in front of you on the highway and say, oh, you know, that's really annoying, but I'm just going to take a deep breath. And you just kind of verbalize your strategy. I'm just going to take a deep breath, and pretty soon I can forget all about how annoying it was that that driver just cut me off. So it's kind of modeling awareness of emotions and moving into a coping strategy. Talk about the motto again, um, and really emphasizing the idea that symptoms aren't the child's fault. Their emotional state is not their fault. It's just what are you going to do about it that you've got some control. So the challenge is twofold. If a child is manic, it's their challenge to bring their mood back down. And if they're depressed, they need to rev themselves up. And kind of how do you help them get through that challenge? Kind of keep acknowledging that motto. You know, you seem to be getting angry. What could you do right now to help? What would help you? Have them do naming the enemy, talk about that. And then we have them uh, do their medication exercise. So we want them to be able to write down what their child's medication and dose is, what the target symptoms are, what kind of side effects, if any, they're experiencing, how they can manage the side effects, and then what are some important features of any particular medicine that they need to remember to keep the child on that medicine safely. And again, parents will come in with great degrees of variability in terms of their understanding of medicine. And their provider will have done a very variable job of explaining all of that to them. Um, so we want to get people onto kind of an even keel on that. So some of our coaches' tips, uh, mood logs are really useful ways to track the child's mood to see if there are any patterns between medication and mood. So we want them, so the first week they just went home and tracked moods, and now we want them to think about moods in relation to the medication that they're on. Awareness comes before change. And even if a child's not on medication, it's useful to monitor symptoms, so then we just keep them on the mood log if they're not coming in on medication. And there's a mood medication log sample, a more complicated sample, and then their breathing exercises. Um, session three. Um, so we, we talk with them about the mental health system and the school system and really want them to come away with the concept that you are the most important member of your child's mental health team. You and your child are really the pivotal members. Um, nothing's going to happen without you. You are the eyes and ears of the treatment team at home. You are the voice that speaks for your child in the school 
and with the treatment providers. Um, so you're going to be deciding on this, and you are the constant in your child's life. You know, therapists, we're going to come and go. Even, you know, people who might see me over the course of their lifetime, um, I'm still only one small part of their life, but the parent is always there. Okay. Um, so the parent is the child's best advocate, and we want them to learn how to do that job really well. So you can improve your child's care by providing organized records and a good history, understanding the diagnostic procedure, so um, understanding how we go through that process of differential diagnosis and patterns of comorbidity, how to follow up with treatment, and we want them to have some understanding of what kind of therapy is out there and what you might want to ask for. So why do I need a psychiatrist and a therapist? You know, kind of what's that all about? What's the role of multiple providers in my child's life? We go through just, again, and you're going to vary how you really go through this based on the constellation of families in your system, but you, in, in your group, but you want them to understand what that system of care is all about. How do they get wraparound services? How do they get uh, in-home care? Is that absolutely not available in your community? Um, how do you get a therapist? What are these different degrees that therapists can have? What does all of that mean? Um, is the background and experience maybe more important than the degree? Um, kind of, so having those kinds of conversations. How do you get hospitalization? What's a residential treatment program, et cetera? People tend not to know all of those things because they didn't get a degree in mental health in order to raise their child. Okay? That's what we did. Then we do the same kind of thing with the school services, which can be an absolute alphabet soup of mystery to parents. You know, there are all these acronyms and OHI and LD and, uh, you know, IEPs and MFEs and what does all of that mean and how does a family start effectively advocating for their child in the school. So we want to give them that framework of what's out there, how do you appropriately get it, how do you become an assertive but not aggressive uh, requester of services within the school. If you go in with your fist in the air and you heard, I have a right to have this and that, it doesn't go down so well with the school. How do you do it in a very diplomatic way? So we go through with them kind of who's who in the system, what all those acronyms mean, and parents start to really share strategies that have worked. And this is where it's really great to have a wide variety of families in the group because they'll start to share tips that work, things that backfired, et cetera. So the mindset that works is trying to build, not burn bridges. Um, you have to know the rules if you're going to effectively use those rules. Um, you need to be reasonable and firm and have a support system. And then we kind of walk them through the nuts and bolts of how do you request a multifactored evaluation, how do you proceed with it, what's an IEP, what's a 504, why would you maybe want this, why would you want that, pros and cons, et cetera. So we go through those kinds of things, lots of kind of common errors, uh, again, what your rights are. And then we go through a series of kind of problem areas and kinds of potential adaptations that you could request or ask for. So we'll go through what can you do in terms of classroom assignments. Um, the goal is clear instructions about in-class and homework assignments and what are some things you can do about that. Uh, goal is positive behavioral management techniques in the classroom and what are some strategies you can recommend. How do you main flexi maintain flexibility? Um, our kids will really wax and wane in terms of what they're able to do at school. So you need to have an a IEP or 504 in place where you've got some flexibility to make it a little bit more intense, back it off a little bit based on the needs of the child. The goal is structure, a structured, highly organized and predictable classroom with clear rules and clear, consistent expectations. So kind of how do you do that? We've got some examples around that. How do you deal with kind of some of the more standard academic sorts of things? Again, lots of our kids have learning disabilities. Um, text, timeliness, um, having a separate set of books at home, et cetera, can be very helpful. On the social emotional front, here are some things you're going to want to make sure that you're aware of. Uh, for kids who can't manage a full school day, you want to think about temporary homebound instruction or partial days. So as a lot of our kids are leaving the inpatient unit, they really can't all transition straight back to a full day at school. So how do you gradually move them back into that school setting? If they have periods of intense emotion, which most of our kids with bipolar disorder at some point will experience at school, you want to proactively have a place within the building that they can go to calm down, where they can give their little signal to their teacher. Their teacher knows that they can walk out of the classroom. Or their teacher can very surreptitiously give them a little signal. That's their sign of 
it's okay, you can go to your chill out spot now, wherever that might be. So that's gonna vary from building to building based on physical plant and personnel. It might be in the antechamber of the guidance counselor's office. It might be one of the schools had kind of an open area inside where the kid couldn't run away but could pace because he needed to get off some energy. Um, it might be going to work with the custodial staff. It might be whatever in that building and with the people involved. So you want, but you want to work that out ahead of time so that the child doesn't keep escalating and do a whole meltdown in the classroom, um, which is much worse than pulling out temporarily to calm down. Um, sometimes teachers will ask me, well, what if the child is doing this just as, in a manipulative way? Like every time there's a math test, suddenly she has to leave the classroom because she hates math. Well, then you have to behaviorally manage that a little bit differently. If you're feeling it like it's just avoidant behavior or oppositional behavior, that you're going to sit on the way you sit on any kind of behavioral intervention, okay? But that's very different from the child who's really trying to gain, maintain control and not spin out of control. Peer conflict, lots of uh, kind of bullying standard strategies here. You need a lot of staff supervision. You need to have a zero tolerance kinds of a policy. When it's our kids who are doing some of the bullying or antagonistic behavior, again, you want to kind of pull them aside and develop a plan uh, around how do you get them not to interact negatively with other kids in the setting. And it's usually when our kids are perceiving a hostile world around them and they're misperceiving the cues. And you've got to kind of pull them out and give them some other strategies. Um, public meltdowns, uh, decreasing the rage during the school day. You want to look at, again, this is where for a school setting, bringing in the school psychologist who can do a functional behavioral analysis can be very, very helpful. Is there something about it, you know, are there triggers or events that precede a rage that's happened at school? Can you start to see what the common elements are at the times that the child falls apart? And then do something about that. Um, so if the child is bored, maybe this is a child who needs enrichment. Um, if this is a child who kind of has those slumps mid-morning, so, you know, you're in the fourth grade, you don't get snacks anymore, but if this kid needs to very quickly excuse himself and go to the nurse's station and drink a juice box and have a granola bar, and if that kind of keeps him going steady for the rest of the morning, more power to him. Go do that. You know, that's going to take five minutes, and it won't cause a big hubbub. Um, great. Kind of keep it, uh, make that happen. You might need to reduce the demands uh, that a child can, can do for a period of time while they're in a more impaired state if they're wanting to stay in school full time. Okay. Attention and concentration, fine motor control. For our kids who have um, tremor with their medicine, you really want a school not to get too hung up on penmanship, but I think schools are decreasingly caring about penmanship um, as we are increasingly keyboarding. Medication side effects, it's really important, and I've had lots of parents who don't want the school to know medicine that the child is on, which really scares me, because if the child is going to have a really negative reaction and nobody at the school even knows, I don't know how the school could appropriately manage it. So we do a lot of preemptive talk with families about when you fill out those little medical cards at the beginning of the school year, really kind of being honest about what the side effects are. Uh, and also when you fill out that emergency contact card, like who would you have if no parent could get to the school, if the child needed to leave the school, who would you really want to come to the school to get the child? You have to think more carefully as you fill out those little emergency contact cards at the beginning of the school year. Talk a little bit about Social Security, how you can get additional funding um, for supplemental security income if eligible, which for some families can be a real lifesaver. How do you file for medical expenses for a tax deduction? Some of those very pragmatic kinds of things that can make it or break it for families in terms of getting the resources they need.